A couple of weeks ago, if you were here, you know that we began the message by recalling some of the ways that families have been portrayed uh, in the media over the years, uh, including uh, this family. There we are. There we go. The Cleavers. Uh, from Leave It to Beaver, but we also talked about the uh, Johnsons and the Baxters in the neighborhood, uh, the Bunkers and Stivics and All in the Family, uh, Ralph and Alice Cramden, for those of us who are old enough to remember them from the Honeymooners. Um, and uh, you'll recall we talked about the fact that many of the portrayals over the years have been positive, uh, some of them not so much. And sometimes I think folks have assumed that the best portrayals of families happened back in the 50s and 60s. You know, the responsible dad, the loving mother, the two kids, uh, you know, like Wally and and, and the beaver who, you know, they got in a little trouble from time to time, but basically good good kids. And that uh, basically since the 50s and 60s, everything has gone downhill in terms of the ways that families are portrayed. And I understand why we might think that. Way, But as we saw a couple of weeks ago, that is not always true. There are still positive portrayals of families. And another one of our favorites at this point in time is the Reagans uh, from Blue Bloods. Um, uh, Reagans, an Irish Catholic family, uh, something of a law enforcement dynasty in the city of New York, if you know the show. Uh, They're not perfect. But they're a strong family. And uh, most weeks the show includes at least uh, one scene with them praying around the table at Sunday dinner. And at those Sunday dinners, if you know the show, you know that there's often laughter. There's often some good-natured ribbing. There are also at times some really serious conversations and some significant disagreements. And yet underlying all of it, there is always this deep affection and respect from the oldest to the youngest. It's a good picture of a family. Which brings us to the text that we have for today. Ephesians 6 verses 1 through 4. There's a series of three teachings here. We'll come to the third one next week. that, That all are kind of poke us in the ribs in one way or another, and today's is no different. So I'm going to invite you to follow along, if you will, as I, re- as I read those first uh, four verses of Ephesians chapter 6. Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. <clears throat> Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, well, again, when we looked at Paul's words to why, when we look at Paul's words to wives and husbands uh, last week or two weeks ago, we said that it was a radical teaching. Well, this is another radical teaching. Uh, Nishe Gupta says that the first Christians were weird, dangerous, and compelling. And a couple of weeks ago, we said that, uh, that part of the way that fleshed itself out was that the, the, the view, the approach that, men, uh, that, that husbands and wives had toward marriage in the first century uh, just sent shockwaves through it. And we talked a little bit about that. The impact was just as big on children and parents. Paul's radical teaching, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, about marriage was to men. Well, today, the radical teaching is probably what he says to fathers. Now, people will say that culture is neutral, that there is no culture that is better than any other. I would beg to disagree, and here's why. In the first century, A father's control over his children was absolute. And it could last as long as the father was alive, even even when his children were grown, mature, 
adults. Fathers could force their children to work like slaves in fields. In fact, a father could sell his children as slaves if he chose. A father could even have a child put to death if he so chose. Now, it was unusual for a father's authority to be carried out to that extreme, but it, but it, but it was possible. And when a child was born, the father would actually decide if the child would live or die. The choice was his. William Barclay observed that when people enter into any society, they take upon themselves the obligations to live a certain kind of life. And if they fail in that obligation, they hinder the aims of their society and bring discredit on its name. Nowhere is that more true than in the church of Jesus Christ. Which is why Paul's words in Romans 12 are so important. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Those early Christians who were weird and dangerous and compelling lived out those words from Paul in their marriages and in their families, including in their parenting. And we will hopefully see why that is so important as we go on. The radical teaching here in the first part of chapter 6 has two reminders in it, first of which wasn't radical in its day. It probably sounds radical in some circles today, but it wasn't radical in in Paul's day, and that's the reminder for children, verses 1 and 2, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Now, <clears throat> there's no scholarly agreement on why Paul calls this the first, the first commandment as he does here, and a lot of theories out there. It may be simply to emphasize its importance. It is it is, it is of great importance. It is first in that sense. Jesus emphasized the importance of this commandment as well, although he did it from a somewhat different angle. Obedience, which Paul talks about here, is critical when we are young. Oftentimes our willingness to obey our, our parents could actually save our lives. But notice that the commandment in Deuteronomy and Exodus isn't just about obedience. It's about honor. Honor your father and your mother. And honor is a much bigger thing. And when Jesus talks about this commandment in Mark chapter 7, he includes things like how we speak about our parents or to our parents. He also talks about how we care for them as they age. And that, that early, in, early in life, we have, an, we have an obligation to obey our parents. Later in life, we may have the obligation to, to make sure that they are well taken care of. That's the one reminder. The other is for parents. And, and this, I'm convinced, is probably more Paul's point here than, than with the children. We're going to flesh it out a little bit more as we go here. But for now, just notice what he says in verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Do not exasperate your children. And, and that has what I would call an implied but a clear warning. Do not exasperate your children. Colossians, he puts it this way, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. As parents, we can and should expect respect from our children. But I think Paul's reminding us here that respect goes both ways. Who knows how many parents 
endlessly criticize their children or micromanage them, especially as they get older? How many, children, how many parents are, are overly strict with their children, needlessly overly strict, at times to the point of cruelty? Where does that lead? Where it leads oftentimes is to driving children away, not just from parents, but from the Lord. Paul's concerned about that. That is not God's design for parenting. Not at all. Let's go back to verse 4 where he talks about bringing up children in the training and instruction of the Lord. And let me just hit really briefly, I mean really briefly on what strong parenting looks like. And by strong, I mean effective. I mean lasting effect, positive lasting effect. Strong parenting, first of all, holds to right priorities. As with most of the rest of this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. <laughs> but parenting has never been easy. We see that in the scripture. But I would argue, and others would argue, there are ways in which it's gotten more complicated and more challenging. Do you know what the frog in the kettle is about? Who knows what the frog in the kettle illustration is about? Yeah, what is it? You want to tell us or you want me to tell? Oh. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's all about turning up the heat. You, you put a frog in a, in, in a kettle of water that's maybe room temperature or cold, and, and you can gradually turn up the heat. And what happens when the water gets hot enough? The frog boils to death. It just doesn't realize that that's what's happening along the way. Now, this, this is not unique to parenting. This is not unique to families, but, but we're talking about parenting here this morning. So let me, let me take that, that tack. I would not be surprised if most, or many at least, if not most families today, including many Christian families, are slowly boiling to death. And they're not boiling to death just because of the impact of media and social media and the change in cultural mores. They're boiling to death in part, in part, because of busyness. Busyness which crowds out the necessary rhythms for mental health and for spiritual health. Ed Creedy has argued that even many Christians today, the use of time is shaped more by culture than by Christ. The default in our culture is to do more. It is to say yes to the point of exhaustion. And that has an impact not only on us individually, it has an impact on our families, it has an impact on our children. And, and, and it's, it, kids are affected, parents are affected, who are so often affected, affected. One of the most sobering statements in the Bible is Judges 2.10. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. What happened? I suspect a number of things. But I don't think I'm off base when I say that one of the things had to be that they forgot or they didn't take seriously Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7, where it says, these commandments, God says, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. 
It's that word impress that strikes me. The picture here as it goes on is of of what I'm going to call disciplined intentionality. Looking for every opportunity to, to encourage children to know who the Lord is and what he's done. And oftentimes, increasingly, that means making choices. The default in our culture is to say yes to all kinds of things. And here's where priorities come in. As parents, we have to make choices. And if we or our kids or our families are too busy to be invested and disciplined in the training and the instruction of the Lord to the next generation, if we or they are too busy, the result will be another generation who does not know the Lord or what he's done. That is not to say that we shouldn't be doing other things. There are lots of good things out there. But we need to make sure that we keep the most important thing the most important thing. Strong parenting also teaches essential truths. Parents, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. There are lots of things we need to know in life, aren't there? What are some of the things we need to know (laughs) to get through life? How to work hard. Live with integrity. integrity. How to feed yourself. Now that does come, that does kind of come in handy once in a while. One of the best things my mom taught me is how to, how to do stuff in the kitchen. <laughs> what else do we need to know? Communication. Pay your bills. <laughs> that also comes in handy. <laughs> Can you think of anything else that, that, that we need to know or is good to know? Pardon? Right from wrong. Yeah, I mean, we, we, could, we could come up with quite a list if we, if we kept going. As I think back on my own parents, you know, I think of a lot of things that I learned from them. One of them was how to, how to survive in the kitchen and how, more than how to survive, how to, how to, how to you know, how, how, to, how to fend for myself with food. I learned how to do my own laundry. That came in handy. I learned how to do boring things like, you know, keep the bathroom clean. I learned how to be smart with money. I learned how to work hard, about being honest, about how to fix things around the house. I learned a lot of things from my parents. And and to be honest, a lot of things I learned from my parents that I have been negligent in passing on to our own daughter, but that's on me. But none of those things, none of those things was the most important thing. And here it comes back to priorities. You know, when when parents present their children for baptism or dedication, we ask them a series of questions. And among those questions are things around their intention to, to teach the word of God to their child and to make sure that their child grows up in the in the community of the church. Why? Because it's in the family and in the church that we learn the most important, essential things. Things of God. My own family, in in the tradition that I grew up in, you know, daily devotions, quiet times, you didn't hear a lot about that. In fact, I don't probably remember hearing anyone use the term quiet time until I was quite a bit older. But I do remember times of family devotions around dinner. And I remember how my folks made sure that I was involved in the life of the church, not only as a young kid, but then through confirmation, and then as I got older. 
I don't recall necessarily a lot of the specific lessons that I learned in those early years, but there are certainly basic spiritual truths that I learned from my parents, that I learned from my pastors, my Sunday school teachers, from from others that stick to me, stick with me to this day. And I am thankful because my parents made sure that I learned essential truths, spiritual truths. Third thing about strong parenting, and by that, again, I mean effective, solid, durable parenting, and that is that strong parenting models Christian discipleship. Modeling. Modeling is more than talking about it. It's more than, it's more than telling kids things. Modeling reflects that old adage that more is caught than taught. And I think that is particularly true of parenting. I don't think any of us would be surprised when I say that nothing is more damaging to our witness than saying A but doing B, C, or D. And nothing is probably more confusing to a child than parents saying A but doing E, F, and G. And that's why Paul in Ephesians 4, 1, which I think is probably a key verse in the entire letter, Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Jesus' brother James says essentially the, the same thing in, in chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, none of us does that perfectly. We, we, we need to accept that. And if we, if we push ourselves to do it perfectly, we're going to drive ourselves and probably everybody else crazy. But there is a question here. For those of us who have children, those of us who have grandchildren or have, have impact on children, do they see us not just talking about Jesus but living a life shaped by Jesus? And if they do, if they do, what they are seeing is Christian discipleship at its best and it will serve them well. It will serve them well. If they don't see that in us, then the question becomes this. Why should we expect them to take following Jesus seriously if we don't? What it comes down to is this, and we'll, you know, there's so many other things, so much more we could say, but it comes down to this. There is absolutely no good substitute for godly parenting. Now, there are lots of substitutes. <clears throat> there are lots of substitutes, but there is no good substitute for godly parenting. That's why if you were here at the annual meeting a couple of weeks ago, you heard me suggest that in the future as a church, we need to invest we need to invest in parents. In fact, I would argue we probably need to invest at least as much, if not more, in parents as we do as we invest in kids because parents are the biggest single influencers on their children. And the best youth program, the best children's ministry, the best fill-in-the-blank is no substitute for godly parents. Let's go back for just a moment to the promise of verse 3. Paul said, starting in verse 2, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, and the promise, verse 3, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. People struggle with what is Paul getting at there. I don't think he is promising you know, a nice, neat formula. If your children obey their parents, then they can assume that they will... Uh, be guaranteed health, wealth, and happiness. His point is that honoring parents is part of God's design. It's part of how he's created the world, part of how he's created humanity. That's why he says it is good, it's right in verse 1. And that when we follow God's design and God's intention... The odds of, turning thing, of things turning out well are significantly increased. 
There's plenty of proof out there that God's ways are indeed the best ways for everyone, even if we try to deny it. The corollary for parents is Proverbs 22, 6, where it says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Again, it's not a nice, neat formula that guarantees a particular outcome. We all know great, godly parents whose children are not particularly great or particularly godly, but that's on the children. Children have to make their own choices, just as parents make their own choices. The parents and grandparents, and I would say others that have influence on, on kids, if we seek to serve our children well, if we seek to serve children well, with solid priorities, with spiritual nurture, with Christ-like living, we are most likely then to see kids be and become all God has created them to be. And that should be the goal of parenting more than anything. Because in the end, there is absolutely no good substitute for godly parenting. And to the effect, to, to the extent that all of us can either be godly parents or incurredly hmm, encourage, there we go, godly parents. We need to do that. Would you pray with me? Gracious God. Gracious God, you have designed the world, you have designed humanity, you have designed life to follow certain patterns. And part of that pattern is parents caring for their children. Not only caring for them physically, but also to, to care for them emotionally and, 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 uh, and, and spiritually. Lord, I thank you for those who have been our parents. And I know none of our parents were perfect, and some of our parents, frankly, were probably better than others. And yet, Lord, these are the men and women whom you use to give us life. And so for no other reason, we thank you for them. Lord, we thank you for parents who have encouraged us to be and become all that you have created us to be, who have taught us, who have modeled for us, who have encouraged us, who have corrected us, who have stood with us, even in hard times even when we have disappointed them tremendously. Lord, thank you for those parents. Lord, for those of us who have experienced parents who maybe were not those things, help us, Lord, to, help us, Lord, to release that. Help us, Lord, to forgive as we have been forgiven. And help us, Lord, to the extent that we are able to, to still honor them and respect them. Lord, for those of us who are parents and grandparents, enable us to live into the opportunities that you have given us and to do it well. To encourage our kids to, to continue to nurture and, and, and guide them along as we have opportunities and, and as appropriate to not exasperate them, to not do things that, that could inadvertently push them away. And Lord, for our children, give them open ears and eyes and hearts to see you in us and in others so that, Lord, they would indeed grow up into the, in, the, in the knowledge and the instruction of the Lord. That they would know what he has done, that they would celebrate that, that they would live into it well so that, Lord, we will see the next generation, not a generation that does not know you or what you've done, 
but a generation that knows you and loves you and carries the gospel on into the future. So Lord, thank you for our parents. Thank you for our children, our grandchildren, for other kids that we have the opportunity to impact. And Lord, may your blessing rest upon them. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.